in Revelation chapter 3 this morning. Revelation chapter 3. Appreciate y'all zooming in with us this morning. Zoom family. Last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 3. And begin reading in verse number 1. John's addressing the seven churches here in Asia Minor. And this is the passage of scripture where he's addressing the church at Sardis. He says in verse 1, And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write these things, saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thou works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I to direct your attention <clears throat> this morning uh, to verse number tw uh, two. He said, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Uh, for I have not found thy words perfect before God. I want to uh, talk to you about the subject of strengthening the things which remain. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask you again to bless your word. And we're thankful for the opportunity Lord, to open it up. And we pray you uh, Lord, guide and direct us in the truth. Help us Lord, to apply these things to our hearts. Examine ourselves, judge ourselves, Lord, if there's anything that needs to be uh, corrected or adjusted, Lord, that that would be taken care of this morning. And uh, again, bless your word, bless the message, ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. According to verse 1, the church of Sardis had a reputation. Um, they they had some works, and they had a, a name that they lived, and yet they were dead. The reputation is what people think about you, character is what God knows to be. They had the reputation that they're alive, but God knew that they were dead. Um, they were there were some things that were ready to die also that needed to be strengthened there in verse two. Need a little little charge, a little TLC, a little extra attention given to them uh, to make sure those things did not die. They would be like somebody in ICU, intensive care unit, so to speak, at the hospital. Well, I'd like to talk to you about some of those things. Uh, that, that need to be taken care of, that they don't die. Uh, some procedures that needs to be taken, or procedures need to be looked at to see if these things are so. so uh, when we get a, a mass of people like in an emergency room, they do what's called a triage. I'm assuming that's French. What Do you know what that means, triage? I know what they do with it, but I don't yeah, they, they look at the, uh, the the patients and see which one needs to be treated first uh, or treated at all. Uh, sometimes, like in an emergency situation, I've read cases in the battlefield where they'll have somebody that looks like they're not going to make it, even though they're alive. They just kind of set them over the side by themselves. And uh, since it's limited resources, they'll tend to somebody that, that – more than likely will make it or has a better chance of making it. Well, that's what I want to do this morning. Look at some things, some areas that, that maybe uh, need some um, TLC or some triage or something to look at in this passage of scripture that may have some life still in it, may be worth putting some extra effort in uh, to get these things revitalized, to get them back in a healthy condition uh, because there, there's some things that hmm, may be ready to die. Um, uh, he said strengthen those things which remain that are ready to die so they're not in good shape amen they're in intensive care they, they've got the possibility of going off the, the edge here if something's not done they're ready to die for I've not found thy works perfect before God that's uh, the first thing I'd like to address is the favorable works that they had he said I know thy works 
He said, but I, I have not found thy works perfect before God. That at least they had some that just wasn't perfect. Um, uh, he, he knew them and knew they weren't perfect, although they were there. So there's some works that indicate that there's some life in the, in the patient, so to speak. They're just not what they should be. And they need to be strengthened, strengthen those things that, that remain. There's, there's, there, there's something that's worth putting some effort in. It's like a doctor sees a patient here that may be on life support and mm, it's close one way or the other, but this one, this one is worth putting the effort into. And that's uh, the favorable work that they have. And, we, and we're called to work. As believers, as children of God, uh, we, we love to quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and there's nothing wrong with that. We should quote it, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But don't forget verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. And what? In good works. We are to produce good works. We're not we're not created by good works and we're not continued to be saved by good works, but we are saved to produce good works, right? We don't do good works to get saved. We don't do good works to stay saved, but because we are saved, God wants us to produce good works. Amen. Don't forget verse 10 in Ephesians chapter two. Uh, we ought to let the world know, let the religious crowd know, uh, let our brothers and sisters in Christ know that we are alive by our good works. Strengthen those good works. Um, we ought to be noted for our good works. Amen. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul said that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Well, that's how you walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. People see fruit. Uh, I'm looking forward to some some fruit this year and, and, and some of the fruit trees I've got at the house. Hopefully we'll get some. Um, I don't want to cut down more fruit trees that wasn't producing <laughs> fruit. Uh, I like fruit. And, and, and that's one of the ways that people uh, say that you're saved is by looking at those those fruits. Um, you know, it seems it's it's a shame that lost people or religious people seem to be more zealous of good works than sometimes God's people are. Of course, I know they got a, a better incentive. They're trying to work their way to heaven. We we're saved by grace. We're just riding on a gravy train, got biscuit wheels on it. I I forget how many years ago. I think it was Warren Buffett. Uh, set up a trust fund or something like that. And he started giving to charity and just millions and millions and millions of dollars given away to different causes. And somebody asked him about it. I hope it was jokingly saying, I'm trying to buy my way to heaven. Well, I got news for you, bud. You ain't going to buy your way to heaven. Uh, the price has already been paid and your money is just like a, a tarnished relic, a, a little slug compared to what the price was that, that uh, was uh, uh, made to, to pay for everybody to go to heaven, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do what? Yeah, it's like a wooden nickel. You're trying to use your money to buy yourself to heaven, buy your way to heaven. It's like spending a wooden nickel for it. Uh, Peter said, we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. That's what your money is. It's silver and gold. If you're trying to buy your way to heaven, it's corruptible. Um, I'm not going to make, it. but you know, lost people, they, they do that. They produce these good works thinking the good's going to outweigh their bad. But those of us that are saved by grace, it seems like we ought to outdo them. I know you can't pay for your salvation. I know you can't re, uh, reimburse the Lord for saving you, but try. <laughs> Amen. Give it a good go. Uh, we ought to work because we are saved. Seem like maybe even much, uh, much more so, uh, knowing what Christ went through to save us to pay for our sins. When the Holy Spirit 
recorded about Dorcas over there in Acts chapter 9. He said in verse uh, 36, now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit recording that in the scripture that this woman was noted for her good works and her alms deeds. That's a, that's a pretty good commendation from, uh, from the third part of the Godhead. Now, I know Luke wrote that, but he was moved by the Holy Spirit to put that in there. And what, one of the reasons that the word of God was given to us that was so we'd have something to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, according to 2 Timothy 3. Uh, he said in verse 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, uh, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Uh, you've got what you need in that King James Bible there to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And God expects you to produce good works, to walk in good works. In Titus 3, 1, he said, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. In Titus 3, 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Titus 3.14, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Well, you can't kind of get the idea that we're supposed to be walking and producing good works. Are your are your favorable works? Are your good works about to die? Are they taking their last breath? Are, are they on life support? Uh, they they need to be defibrillated or <laughs> to get them pumped back up CPR maybe you need to, to examine yourself and see see about it I mean good night man there, there's such an emphasis put on good works for a child of God and yet he told this church here that um, they're ready to die strengthen those things which remain that are ready to die for I've not found thy works perfect before God how about yours all right. Number two, not only uh, do they need to strengthen the favorable works, but they need to strengthen a fixed watch. Notice there in verse two, and I'm not talking about a wristwatch or a clock, um, but he said, um, be watchful, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. I'm afraid a lot of God's people have a problem with uh, their their watching and, and being watchful. We're kind of lethargic we're kind of asleep in this day and age webster defines uh, watchful as being vi vigilant attentive careful to observe observant and cautious uh, a lot of god's people like to watch things they shouldn't be watching and not watching things they should be watching amen amen, amen. Second Timothy four or five, Paul said, "But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry." Be, be watchful. What do you watch? Well, watch your mind. Um, I, I read. Uh, I think it was. I think it was John Wesley, one of them old time preachers. Uh, somebody asked him if he if he had a. Uh, a problem with his thought life and he said yeah sometimes and they asked him what he what he does about that and he said well listen i'm not responsible for a bird flying over my head i am responsible if it makes a nest there maybe i mean maybe you can't help things running through your mind sometimes but you don't you don't have to dwell on them, think on them all the time you can uh, uh think on some good things or some better things you can think on the things that you're supposed to be thinking of according to um, Philippians chapter 4 and speaking of that in Philippians chapter 2 about your mind he said fulfill you my joy that you be like minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through strife or vain glory but in lowliness of mind 
let his let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the, the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Keep a watch on your mind. Amen. I I, I don't know what it is with uh, with Christians. We we think about well, it. The mind just take care of itself. Uh, you let it do that, man, it'll devolve into apostasy before you know it. It'll go downhill. Um, it, it said low battery mode, but um, <laughs> um, uh, somebody said, you talking about your mind, you are the books you read, the movies you watch, the music you listen to, the people you spend time with in conversation, um, are the people you spend time with, the conversation you engage in, choose wisely what you feed your mind. Choose wisely what you feed your mind because the, uh, the TV you watch, the books you read, the people you hang around, the music you listen to, all those things, the conversations you have, they have an effect on your mind. Amen. So watch your mind. Keep a watch on it. Keep a watch out for your enemies. Well, the Bible says, uh, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. The Bible talks about the snares of the devil. Snares are put in places where the, the game or the object of being snared don't see it. Right? Uh, the, the, uh, uh, Proverbs talks about that. The, the, the snare is... A vein when it's put inside of the, the, the fowl or the bird, the bird sees it, he's not going to get in it. Well, the devil's sneaky. He's tricky about putting snares in where you wouldn't think they would be. He's a subtle. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I, I used to watch uh, like uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom and some of those nature shows and stuff like that. I, like, I still like to read about them. I, I've read sometimes where a lion will sneak up on its prey and it will take hours to get there. It's like down in the, the, the brush or the, the, the brambles and stuff and it's just slowly inching forward. And then when it gets close enough to where it figures it can outrun its prey, it'll spring and jump on there. But just sneaking up there, taking time. And it's, sometimes that's the way the devil does a child of God. We need to realize we have an enemy and he's sneaky and subtle. Keep an eye on the enemies. Jeremiah had some enemies. I'm sorry, Nehemiah had some enemies while he was trying to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7, he said, It came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very raw and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayers unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. I find it interesting he used the word they conspired. His enemies conspired. You talk about somebody conspiring now, they say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Well, there's no theory to it, people. Get your head out of the sand and realize that your enemy will conspire against you. And you need to keep a watch. Now, there may be some dispute or argument about actually who the enemy is, but there's definitely a conspiracy against the child of God. No doubt about it. It can be proven. It can be demonstrated. It's an historical fact. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy fact. You need to be watched. And I know you can go overboard with conspiracies, but don't discount them. They are real. We need to watch our minds. We need to watch our enemies. We need to keep a watch on our opportunities. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, the Bible says, that As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. You've got to be watchful for opportunities. There's plenty of them out there. A lot of people miss them because they're not being watchful. I've done that. I've missed opportunities. Uh, I'll go back. Oh, man, I wish I'd have done that. I, I wish I'd have given that. I wish I'd have give, passed out that track. I wish I'd have said this. I wish I'd have done that. Uh, be watchful of those opportunities. He's uh, 
encouraging them there in, in uh, chapter 3, verse 2, be watchful. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, Solomon said, uh, Whatsoever thy hand find to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. One of these days that the Lord tarries, your opportunities for doing good is going to be gone. Your opportunities for speaking the right words going to be gone. Your opportunities for helping somebody is going to be gone. <laughs> Excuse me. Keep a watch on your opportunities. And um, he said, be watchful. We need to be watchful for the Lord's return. Watch your mind. Watch your enemies. Watch your opportunities. Watch for the Lord's return. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching thus that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. There's another one about good works, but we ought to be watching for the Lord. Um, we're, 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 we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you looking for him today? You hoping he might come today? Amen. I uh, I appreciate some of these guys that are smarter than me, more spiritual than me, and more in tune with the Lord than me that, that tries to set a date for the Lord to come back. And I've seen scores of them over the years. Maybe I should say dozens of them over the years. Uh, the Lord's coming back in 79. The Lord's going to come back in 89. The Lord's coming back in 90. The Lord's coming back in 93. And the Lord's coming back in 2000. I mean, I've heard compelling arguments for all of them, and he hadn't come back yet. I wonder sometimes if that does a disservice to the body of Christ, kind of, I don't know, get the wind out of their sails or it's a disappointment. I mean, if you think the Lord's coming back and he doesn't, it's like, hmm, well, maybe I'll quit listening to all that junk and just listen to the Lord said he is coming back. We don't know exactly when. We know the times and the seasons. We don't know the day and the hour. Don't get disheartened and skeptical about that. Keep looking for him. I've, I've had people ask me when I when I think the Lord's coming back. And I said, my pat answer is, I don't know, maybe today. You know, can you give me a year? Nah, maybe today. I don't know. Uh, smarter people than me have given dates and they missed it. I, I don't know. I, I just hope it's today. I know this. We ought to be watching. We ought to be watching like he is coming back today. Maybe he will. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Amen. Um, I know this is a second advent reference, but I'm going to read it to you anyway when the Lord was talking to the apostles over there in Mark chapter 13. He said in verse 33, take heed, watch. Amen. Watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So even if that is the second advent admonition and passage of scripture with the Jews in the time of Jacob's tribulation, at the end of that thing, he said, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. And we have that admonition with the, the apostle Paul to watch. So what? Well, watch your mind. Watch your enemies. Watch your opportunities. Watch for the Lord to come back. Watch your words. Watch your actions. Watch your thoughts. Watch your character. Amen? Watch your habits. There's your good one. The W-A-T-C-H. Watch your words, your actions, your thoughts, your character, and your habits. That'd be something to keep a, a watch on. Uh, is your is your watching about to die? You going to sleep? There's something about people that sleep they don't they can't watch. 
in time of war, if a sentry's put on guard duty and he falls asleep, it used to be like this. I don't know if it's still like this, but that's automatic death penalty. If you fall asleep on guard duty in time of war, because they're trusting you, they're dependent on you, your whole squad or company or whatever you're guarding, they're dependent on you. Well, folks, maybe the Lord ain't that stringent about us watching, but he is pretty serious about it when he tells us over and over and over again, watch, be sober, be vigilant. Strengthen your watching ability. Your your favorable works, your fixed watch. Last of all, I'd like to say this, something else that uh, might need to be strengthened there in verse 4. He said, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they uh, and they they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The, the favorable works, the fixed watch, the faultless wardrobe. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> amen. Their, their, their garments were not defiled. They had some garments that were white, unspotted. Over there in Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 5, the Bible says that there, and a voice came out of heaven saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife have made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That's a group of folks there that's garments with their righteousness. They're doing right. That's the righteousness of the saints. Do you know what's done in a lot of believers? The idea of doing right. It's amazing to me how saved people, professing saved people, Christians, when I say professing, I don't know where, whether you are or not. I'm only sure about myself, and sometimes I wonder then. <laughs> but, 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 but saved people, people that say they're saved, do stuff that they know is not right. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. I hadn't strengthened those things that remain. Um, so. Yeah, it, it, it seems like the ones that's trying to do right, get it in the neck, and the ones that, and I'm talking about saved people, the ones that do wrong, just, what well, Job experienced that, Asaph experienced that. But we need to be strengthening the idea of doing right, and if, if that's the righteousness of the saints, it's like that's, sewing together a garment you're going to be wearing someday from what from doing right the the threads and the the yarn and the material <clears throat> and stuff is building material that's making you uh, a robe a robe of righteousness now i know we have the the righteousness of jesus christ imputed to our account that's on the inside and the the righteousness of the saints is what we wear on the outside doing right in Romans chapter 13, verses 12 to 14, Paul said, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Ephesians 4.24, he said, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Uh, look, let us walk honestly. They, these are good works that we can do that are righteous acts that is the righteousness of saints. Strengthen those things which remain. I bought a, it was at the thrift store yesterday, and the dude had a, a they call them worm farms. It's a plastic bins and it's on wheels and kind of got like a uh, hand truck action to it. And I looked up the, the brand and it was from New Zealand. It sold for over $300. He had a price tag on for $85. And I take stuff up there to donate to him. And he get, usually gives me a deal. I said, how much, what's the least you could take for that? And he said, $70. I'll take $70 for it. I said, oh, 
answer too much. Hey, so go ahead and get it. I said, I don't know. So worms, that's kind of high. <laughs> Her and him both are trying to get me to get it. I said, fine, okay, I'll get it. I'll buy it. And we had some other stuff. And, and um, with that, it was like $82. So I had a $100 bill. I gave it to him. I got to talking to him. <clears throat> Starts giving my chains back. And I just folded it up, put it in my wallet. Got out there and loaded up the stuff, loaded up my worm thing. And I, I thought, well, that's a lot of change back. And I looked and it was $82. He gave me the change instead of, <laughs> instead of charging me that much. So what were you doing, Andy? I went back in there and I said, hey, John, can I talk to you? I didn't want to get him in trouble. I think he owns the place, so he probably wouldn't have got in trouble. But I said, I think you gave him the the price of the thing instead of the change back. And he looked and he said, oh, it's good. He said, man, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you did that. He's a Christian, a pervasive Christian. Also. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do. What my money is yours. But he was gobsmacked that a Christian would do that. A saved person, professing saved person would do that. Shocked. And I thought that is a sad testament for professing Christianity that somebody would be shocked that a Christian would do what's right. Folks, there's some things that are dying that need to be strengthened. We need to strengthen the things that remain, the favorable works, the fixed watch, and the faultless wardrobe. Let's don't let them things die. They may die in, in society. They may die in the, the major part of Christianity. I'm talking about you as an individual and we as a church. Let's not let those things die. Let's strengthen the things that remain. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank the Lord for the warnings you give us in your word. And help us, Lord, to take these warnings to heart and uh, to put them into practice or to strengthen the things that remain, the favorable works, the fixed watch, and the faultless wardrobe. And I pray you'd bless this message, Lord, bless your word to those that have heard it and dismiss us with your blessings. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let's take a break. <clears throat>